he was interrupted by a riot that was started by the, uh, the Jews in that city. And he was driven out of town and went to Corinth. And from Corinth, he wrote this letter to the church, First and Second Thessalonians, which in essence complete a message that was interrupted on that Sabbath day a year earlier, explaining the truths of the second coming of Christ, the rapture of the church, and end times. So let's take a look. I'm going to actually begin where we um, began last week reading, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. So First, Thess First Thessalonians chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia. Your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture. We're so delighted to be gathered in your name. And Father, I'm so thankful to be surrounded by men and women who have a hunger for God. Lord, we're asking by your Spirit that you would do a remarkable work in our hearts. God, transform us, change us, renew us, refresh us, and give us a new vision and a, and a new understanding of your great revelation of your heart and your, your love, as well as your future and the plans that you have for us as a church. In all these things, Father, we ask that your Spirit might reign supreme and that you might guide. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. I've entitled the message this morning, The Evidence of New Life, because that's what really Paul is talking about. He's identifying all these beautiful characteristics of this young, fledgling Thessalonican church. You'll recall from last week that three things that he pointed out about the church that were really admirable is their work produced by faith, their labor prompted by love, and their endurance inspired by hope. And we spent a little time talking about endurance. You remember hupomone? Hupo means under, meno means to remain. Hupomone means to stay under the weight of the trials or the challenges of life without running, collapsing, or giving up, or working the angles. But you're waiting for God to lift it off in his due time. It's the only dance I really know how to do. I told you I can't really dance very well, so this is one I can do. You know, it's just kind of, you bend your knees a little bit and you hold the weight up. But I got to share something with you. You have to stand up and you have to help me out for a minute. Just for a minute. I know some of you are like, oh no, he's going to make us do it again. That's right, I'm going to make you do it again. Because God spoke to me right after I got down from the pulpit last week and showed me something, and I was like, ooh. But he said, wait until next week to share it. So it's next week I'm going to share it with you, okay? So do the hupomone, okay? You're bending your knees a little bit, and you're, you're, you're under the weight of the challenge that God has allowed in your life. He may not have brought it, but he's allowed it. And you're not going to move, you're not going to do anything except hold on to God, and you're going to sit under that until God lifts it so that his glory can be magnified. Now, here's what's really crazy. You know how the Bible says that we're to do this with joy? Don't drop your hands. I didn't, Simon doesn't say drop your hands. Uh, do, you, do you know how the Bible says we're to do this with joy? This is so cool. Okay, just go like this. And what does it become? Praise and worship. Isn't that amazing? So you can take this that is a part of the Christian life, this ability to endure and persevere, and just take it just a little farther, and it turns into praise and worship. And that is awesome, what God can do. Okay, you can sit down. So this hupomone in these Thessalonians' lives in the midst of their persecution was turning into worship and praise, and Paul was blown away by the reports that he was getting about this brand new church and their rapid maturity and their rapid obedience to the work of God in their life. 
And that's where we pick it up in verse 4. He begins by affirming that they were loved by God. Love, of course, is agapeo, this word that we're so familiar with in the, in the church and in the New Testament. But this particular uh, verbiage that Paul uses is important because grammatically it's in the perfect passive participle. Perfect means it's a past tense event that's settled once and for all. Passive means that we're not doing it, someone else is doing it, and of course the someone else doing it and loving us is God. And it's in the, it's in the participle form, meaning that it's ongoing. So the love that God has for the Thessalonians is an, an event that's already taken place, it's permanently established, never to be changed, being done by God, and they're experiencing it day by day by day by day. It just never stops. And it's solid. It's firm. That's the kind of love that God has for his church. It's the kind of love, by the way, he has for you. Paul goes on and he says, you are also chosen by God. This word is ekleo, and uh, it means to elect or to choose, which gets us into the really challenging doctrine of election and free will. Now, if you know anything about those two doctrines, it promotes a lot of controversy at times, especially like in Bible colleges and seminaries, and sometimes even in churches. And uh, what I want to do is take just a minute to explain it and then make some comments on it as it relates to this passage. The one thing that we know about um, the doctrines, doctrine of election, known as Calvinism, is that it teaches that, that man is basically so corrupt and utterly sinful that he's incapable of responding to the gospel unless God it previously selects a person and chooses them. In other words, they can't even respond to the gospel if they wanted to because they're so wicked and corrupt and sinful. The other view is the free will view, where again they recognize the corruption of man and that man is marred by sin, but yet any and every man or woman who so desires is capable of responding to the gospel, being forgiven of their sins, and being assured of eternal life. Those two views are both taught in the Bible. The Bible says that he chooses and elects. And then simultaneously it says anyone that wants to come to Christ can. That Christ died for all, not a select few. God sent his son to make salvation possible for all mankind. So we have both of these apparent contradictory statements being made in the Bible. And there's actually a word for it. It's antinomy. And it means that you've got, in essence, um, uh, you have the appearance of a contradiction between principles and conclusions that are equally necessary and true. And all I can say about this is that though I can't, after 30 years, come to a, a conclusion that makes complete sense to me, I've come to the point of accepting both as valid and biblical. So I don't try to unwind it anymore. You know what the biggest mistake people make when it comes to election and free will? Is landing on one or the other. That's a terrible mistake, in my opinion, because the Bible teaches both. Though my finite my mind can't grasp it and fully comprehend it, that doesn't give me permission to change the word of God. So what I do when I come to a passage that says someone's chosen, I, I preach you're chosen and elected by God. Can you believe that? Before time began, God knew your name, and he chose that you would have eternal life. And yet when we come to those passages that, that indicate very clearly that Christ died for all, and anyone who would come and respond can receive eternal life. I preach that and say, you can do this if you want to. It's in your power. God has enabled you to have free will to be able to make that choice. And so I think it's an important thing to realize that, uh, that God is comfortable with both. Predestination is clearly taught in the Bible, but God has also made it clear that salvation is available to anyone who would so choose. What we do know while we may not be able to untangle those doctrines completely to our satisfaction, what we do know is the evidence of someone who's either been chosen and elected by God or someone by their free will has received that message, the evidence is the same. And Paul begins to detail some of that evidence in verse 5. He assures them because he says, the gospel came to you, the passage says, not only with words, which means what? Exactly, it came with words. And all of you said that together at the same time. <laughs> kind of set you up. Sorry about that. But the word of God came with words. Have you ever heard a statement that, uh, if you've been around in the church any length of time, you've probably heard this. Preach the gospel and use words, use words if necessary. Have you heard that? I heard that years ago. It, it actually uh, had its foundation in a parachurch college ministry. 
And, uh, and when I heard it, I thought, wow, that's deep, you know, but there's something tickling at the back of my mind thinking there's something not right about that. Preach the words, use words if necessary. Well, I want to tell you, words are necessary. That's a contradiction of the Bible. I'm, I'm going to be bold and say that's bad theology to say preach the words, use words if necessary. Kind of the concept is, is that you've got to earn the right to preach the gospel. Where does it ever say in the Bible you have to earn the right to tell people how to escape hell? No, we, we preach the word. And where does it say that you have to somehow prove yourself before you can share? Or that, uh, that somehow people are going to catch this message simply by watching your life? Do you know how many people will go to hell because they thought that their Christian neighbor, who they didn't even know was a Christian, was such a good person but never communicated the gospel, and they were pursuing just trying to live a moral and ethical life like their good neighbor. And the good neighbor is thinking, I wonder when they'll ask me what the difference is in my life. No, the Bible says the gospel needs to be preached. And that's why Paul says in Romans 10, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in, and how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard, and how can they hear without someone preaching to them? We need to preach the gospel. And maybe preach is the wrong word, although it's a biblical word. We just need to tell people. We just need to let them know and give them a chance at life eternal. And so Paul says, part of the reason I know, Thessalonians, that you are elect by God and that you are indeed saved is because you responded to the message. Real simple. And then the second thing he says is that you responded to the gospel and its power. There was something dunamis explosive about their response to God. Now, there's several possible meanings for this, but I think the most obvious one is that the gospel itself has power. Romans 1.16 tells us that Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is what? The power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. It's the power of God. I don't know how it works. I can't explain it. I can't organize the thoughts in my mind from a, from a, a, a logical sense, but what I can tell you is that the gospel, because God has said so, because God has imbued it with this, God says it has power, not just influence, but dunamis power to change a life. So when we're sharing the gospel, we can have a, a, a great confidence that it's not an issue of just trying to convince people or trying to, um, uh, to uh, debate with people, debate them into the kingdom, but it's an issue of the fact that God says His word in the gospel has power, supernatural power, and it was evidenced in this church. And he says, also, it came with the Holy Spirit. Paul says something similar in 1 Corinthians 2 when he says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. What power he's talking about? Well, the influence of the Spirit working through the preaching of the message and the responsiveness of the people's hearts, but we also know that oftentimes throughout the New Testament that the gospel was accompanied by miraculous signs. And I have no doubt that part of Paul's ministry in Thessalonica was healing and, and, uh, and helping people be delivered from demons and possibly raising the dead. In in those cases, what's happening is there's a demonstration, not just of some guy coming along and giving a message, but there's there's a supernatural affirmation coming from God saying, this gospel is being confirmed by me by these miraculous signs. We're also told that the gospel came to them with deep conviction. It's not talking about a conviction of the heart over sin. It's talking about an entirety of of, uh, confidence. So it's coming to the Thessalonican church and they're responding in such a way that the end result is they feel totally confident that God has changed their life. That's why the Bible says that we're to, be, we're to be really examining ourselves to see if we're in the faith. We should have an internal confidence. That confidence comes from the Spirit of God confirming in our hearts that we indeed belong to the Father. And it's going to be accompanied by some other things we'll see in a moment. But these are things that Paul points to and says, I have total confidence that not only are you loved by God, but you've been chosen by God, and here's the evidence of it. You responded to the gospel. You're, you're, you're experiencing this new life, and we're seeing evidence of it in how you're conducting yourself. This is a really encouraging message for a new church. It's like, really? We're, we're, we're tracking? We're doing it right? And Paul says, yes, you are but it's because of God's work in you. 
had to be so encouraging to this church that's suffering so much at the hands of their persecutors. But the second part of verse 5, Paul says something else. He says, I want to remind you of my example while I was among you. This word example is the Greek word tupas. It, uh, it means to stamp or in to imprint. So if you have a die and you're gonna, you want to cast a die and then you want to print that over and over and over, that's a tupas. And that tupas, Paul is saying, I left my tupas, my genetic spiritual DNA, stamped in your life during the time I was there. You saw what I did. You saw how I conducted myself. In fact, Paul often appeals to his personal example throughout Scripture as a model to follow for the church to, to take as an example. And, and he's not shy about it, by the way. Uh, I'm going to share a few verses with you in a moment, but he's not shy at all about saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's something that's a little frightening for most of us to do, but it's something that Paul was more than happy to do. He was willing to present himself as a flesh and blood, tangible human being that other new believers who are novices in the faith can look to and model themselves after. He presented himself as a tupas, a stamp or a die or a model, an example for them to be able to model themselves after as well. And that's what he says in verse 6 and 7. Paul encouraged them because they became imitators of Paul and of the Lord Jesus Christ. This word imitators is the word mimites in the Greek, and it's where we get our English word to mimic or to copy. You know, one of the, one of the I guess it's been said, the, the greatest form of flattery is to be copied or to have someone mimic you. One of the things that's happening in all of our lives are people are mimicking us. We may not realize it, but if you have kids especially, uh, they're copying you. They're taking everything in. One of, the, one of the great privileges that I have as a dad is to be able to model for my sons. And I'm really clear about it with my sons. And I'm going to challenge you to do with your family what God has called me to do with my family, and we're going to take it even farther than that, is for me to present myself as a tupas to my sons and to say, follow my example as I follow Christ. So over the years, my, my oldest son is 16 and my youngest son is 15, and uh, they're both just doing so well. I'm really proud of both of them. But over the years, I've taught them all kinds of things, and Becky's taught them all kinds of things. But my role in particular is to prepare them so that when they're 18, they are ready to be launched into life in adulthood without any gaps in their life. So it needs to cover the, the uh, social uh, skills. They need to know how to treat their mom because how they treat their mom is going to be how they treat their wife. They need to know how to treat each other. They need to know how to reconcile and get along with one another and with other people in their life. They need to know how to lead. They need to know how to take care of finances. They need to know how to make decisions and how to, to plan and how to structure their life. They need to know how to set priorities for their life. They need to know a, a series of skill sets, like how to write a check and how to open a bank account. And all these things are things we're doing with them. How to manage their family life. How, it, as watching me work with my wife, how a man should treat his wife. There's a, a whole series of things, not the least of which is how to walk with God. So how to develop their spiritual life, how to have a quiet time, how to lead their own family spiritually. And for, for our family, it's not a matter of, of an event that takes place, but it's a lifestyle. It has to be, because in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Bible commands those that are fathers or mothers, while they're walking, while they're sleeping, while they're standing, while they're lying down, whatever they're doing throughout the day, they are to be instructing and investing in their children, being a tupas a stamp, a die, an example, a model, so that their children will have a tangible skin living, you know, somebody, a, a body with skin on it, where they can actually see what it's supposed to look like in action. I don't always get it right. Um, I, on more than one occasion, I, I love to, I'm a tease. I love to play. I, I, I really like to be fun. I have a a pretty good sense of humor. You guys might not all know that because I really hold myself back a lot, you know, because there are times I just want to bust out some kind of a weird joke and tell you what's on my mind, but what's on my mind is kind of scary sometimes, and so I'm sparing you. But, but sometimes at home, I don't spare my family, and I tell them what I'm thinking, you know, and, and my wife will say, Bob, the boys are going to follow that example, and the boys jump right in on that, and they're like, and they take it, what they do is that they're not satisfied with going as far as I did, they take it a step farther. And then I have to reel it in. And, and so constantly, there's this sense of, I'm a model for my family. And it's an important thing that Paul lays out. Listen to what Paul says. He says, 
I urge you to imitate me, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, he says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Philippians 3.17, join with others in following my example. And then in Philippians 4.19, he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Can you still hear me? Kind of? Okay. Lord, stop the rain. And it's also an example of uh, being imitators of the Lord. And what did the Lord say when people wanted to follow him? He says, if anyone wants to follow me, must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. So Jesus also had no, there was no shyness whatsoever about presenting himself as a model. Paul picked up on that, and he was willing also to present himself as a model. And ultimately, the goal of all this is that we would be conformed to the image of Jesus. That's what we're told in Romans 8.29. That's the goal. So if you have not been completely sanctified, meaning that you are absolutely Christ-like right now, if you are not absolutely Christ-like every moment of every day, then you are still in this process, which means that you still need to be changing, which means that the words from the Apostle Paul to Timothy are appropriate not only for you but for me. And what he said is, what did he say? I'm trying to remember what he said right now. He said, let your progress be evident to all. Keep making progress. So there's no room, especially for us old dogs, I won't call, say, dogettes, but the old guys, um, there's not room for us to suddenly say, we've gone far enough, and that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm as good as, I, as I'm going to get because I don't want to move any farther. We cannot do that, ever. We need to keep making progress in our faith, following good examples and then simultaneously being a good example, which leads me to my question of application. Who are you modeling your life after? I want to suggest to you that there should be at least one person in your life that makes you a bit uncomfortable to be around. You know where I'm going with this? We have a tendency to want to be with people that don't challenge us, that we can just kind of let our hair down with. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, and we ought to be with people that, that are, are fun to be with, but simultaneously, we need to expose ourselves to people that are a little bit ahead of us that are, are, are working toward that same goal of Christ-likeness and, and clinging to that at some point, at some level, with at least one person in our life. It's important because every person here needs to be challenged to keep moving forward. Simultaneously, my second question is, who are you providing that modeling for? There's no question in my mind that every man and woman here at some level is modeling for people because people are watching you. They know you're a believer if you're a Christian. And they're watching you. Very carefully, by the way. But there's a big difference between accidentally modeling for people and intentionally modeling. Paul was an intentional model, so much so that he told people, I know you don't know exactly what this is supposed to look like, but I want you to know that because I'm following Christ and, and under the favor and direction and empowerment of the Holy Spirit, I'm growing and moving and advancing in that direction. I'm presenting myself to you as a reliable role model that you can follow. Now, it's not perfect. Nobody's looking for perfection. But what we are looking for is a person that's actually growing in this faith. And I want to say just uh, one more thing on that that, uh, that uh, I want to address because the next thing that we find is that they're modeling for others. But I want to talk about this issue of being a model and presenting yourself as a model because the, the question then is, is asked, if this is such a common practice with Jesus and the New Testament church and Paul and Timothy and Silas and Barnabas and on the list goes with Peter, why are people not doing that today? Why isn't the church filled with men and women who are telling new converts or people in their life, hey, you know what, I know that you're kind of newer, hey, just follow my example, you know? Or why aren't we telling our kids, you know, son or daughter, I want you to know that I want to present myself as a tupas as much as possible in the power of God for you to model your life after which means that, you know, we have to be accountable for our behavior. But I'm presenting myself in that fashion to you, and I'm saying, follow my example as I follow Christ. I would venture a guess that if I asked you to raise your hand, who has had someone in your life say that, we would have very few hands in this congregation. And the, and the question is, why? Why did we lose that that was being passed on down by the disciples? Well, I've got three reasons that I've come up with. These aren't necessarily biblical reasons. These are things that, that I believe are true. I think that the hidden message behind this bad theology 
And I'm going to give you another, you know, I gave you the word earlier about preach the word, use words if necessary. I think that's bad theology. Here's another one that we've adopted and not really uh, examined very carefully. When somebody talks about the church and they talk about the hypocrisy of the church, what do we say? Don't look at man, man will, follow, will fail you. And don't look at me, look at God, correct? Bad theology. Where do you find that in the Bible? It doesn't say that anywhere in the Bible. In fact, it says the opposite. It says, follow me as I follow Christ. So why don't we do this? And, and I want to say even more, more pointedly, what's the hidden message behind don't follow me, follow Christ? Three things that I have that I've come up with. The first is that I don't plan to be obedient. I've already got provision in my flesh that I'm not going to give up certain things and change certain things. And if I present myself as a model, it means that I'm actually going to be scrutinized in my obedience. And I don't plan to be obedient, so I don't want to say those words. So it's really convenient to pass it off and say, don't look at me. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to fail you. I'm telling you right now, I'm, going to, I'm a miserable wretch, and I'm carnal, and I'm not really walking with the Lord that closely. So don't look at me. I don't, who, do, who should I look at? Well, look to Jesus. Well, that's really wonderful. But people need an example. And Paul was willing to give it, and so was Jesus, and so were the early apostles. And the church has been doing that for centuries, millennia. The second reason I think that uh, we don't do it and why there's a hidden message is that we don't want to be accountable. Because if I present that message to my boys and my wife, then what I'm doing is I'm giving them permission to not only follow my example, but to call me on my failures. And my boys and my wife have permission to do that. And they do it, and I'm really glad for it. I have, like, built-in accountability in my house. We have tenants upstairs as well uh, that can hear everything that happens in our house. So I don't have permission to yell or scream or get in a fight with my wife. We got in a fight the other day, and the tenants weren't home. Yes! <laughs> but I have all this accountability in my life, and I'm so thankful for it because it, it really constrains me. Now, is, is being constrained from sinning bad? I don't think so. I think that's a good thing. But it helps to train me to be a man who is accountable for my behavior. And the benefit, of course, is that I'm growing. But I think our desire not to be accountable is part of why we don't want to present ourselves as a model. And the last thing, the last hidden message, is that I don't want to be responsible for someone else. You know, I'm barely hanging on by my fingernails, we might say. And I, don't, I just don't even have energy to even think about being responsible for someone else's spiritual growth. You be responsible for you, I'm barely hanging on. Well, that's not the Christian life that God has called us to. And so Paul, in his courage and his love, because really, you know what this is all based on? It's not pride. It's not ego. It's not him trying to clone himself. What it's based on is Paul's great love for God and the calling he had to replicate himself. And secondly, his great love for this Thessalonican church and all the other churches he said these same words to because he wanted to give them a tangible, human example, a tupas, of what they can be and what was God was calling them to be. And the side benefits, by the way, are enormous for your life. I know for myself that I've got all these forms of accountability right in my own home that have caused me to grow tremendously more than any other relationships I've got. It's the home life and the accountability I have there that has transformed my life. And I'm still growing. I still make mistakes. But there's accountability, and there's repentance, and there's reconciliation. It's a biblical process that even that itself becomes a tupas for the family. And so Paul says that they were imitators. They were mimicking or copying, not mocking, but using Paul and the Lord as examples of what they were to be. Paul also says more evidence of this wonderful changed life is that they received the message and welcomed it with joy in spite of severe suffering. And boy, they had severe suffering in Thessalonica. And they received it with joy that was given by the Holy Spirit. We find this kind of joy, this hupomone that turns into praise, all over the New Testament. The apostles get arrested and beaten, and they're worshiping God. They get arrested and thrown in jail, and they're worshiping in the night watches of the night. And people are watching everywhere and coming to Christ because of the suffering they went through, and yet the joy that was accompanying their suffering because they realized for the first time suffering in the past was just a bummer as an unbeliever. Suffering as an unbeliever is a bummer. I hate to, there's no, it's, it's, I'm not saying it can't be redemptive, 
But suffering as an unbeliever doesn't have nearly the significance of suffering as a Christian because for a Christian, it's advancing the cause of Christ in every arena of our life. But as an unbeliever, we just are surviving it. As believers, we're thriving and gaining victory, and the Thessalonican church was no exception. And the result of all these things, following the the tupas, this DNA spiritual imprinting of the Apostle Paul and mimicking it, what happened next? They became a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Model, a tupas. So what Paul was for them, now they become for other people. And they're only one year old in the Lord. I have to tell you, I really love hanging around brand new Christians. You know why? Because they don't know what the rules are yet. They don't know that they're not supposed to be excited about Jesus. They don't know that they're supposed to tone it down and keep it on the, on the, on the cool side so that people don't freak out and wonder, what happened to you? They don't know that they're not supposed to immediately pass on how to have a quiet time and immediately pass on how to pray and immediately pass on how to be obedient to God. They don't know that yet. They're too young. And so one of the most exciting things to be around is a new believer. And one of the, one of the things that is not quite as exciting to be around is an old dog who has lost the vision for being a tupas. And, and, and they actually are intimidated by the young Christian, and they try to calm them down, and they feel a little violated when this person gets so excited and comes up to them all, you know, you know excited, I've got to tell you what I've learned in my quiet time. And the person's thinking, I haven't had a quiet time in a month, you know. Uh, okay, share what, share what you have. And they're, and they're just like, you know, they're just, they're just like a dog, you know, a puppy, you know, just, you know, and it's just like you want to calm them down. And I'm like, why? Why do you want to calm someone down who's excited about the Lord? Don't calm people down. Stir them up. Fan them into flame. And so they took what was given to them and they just passed it on. They became a tupas for the church in Macedonia and Achaia. Nobody told them that they didn't have a Bible college degree. Nobody told them they didn't have a seminary degree. They didn't know that they were completely disqualified from doing this. They did it anyway because God was working. And it was transformational. And we find what happens here because the sequence of events, again, was Christ modeling for the church. And Paul picked that up. And he modeled himself after Christ. And the Macedonian church, actually, well, before that, Silas and Timothy were modeling themselves after Paul. Silas and Timothy were left in Thessalonica during that year. And the Macedonian church modeled themselves after Silas and Timothy. And then the Macedonian church modeled for all of Macedonia and Achaia. The Thessalonican church modeled for Macedonia and Achaia. And, And this is discipleship. It's so simple. Do you realize that they didn't have a program or a plan? There was no missions budget. They didn't have a missions committee or a team. They had no evangelistic crusade and no big white tent. How could they possibly get anything done? Well, they just did it in the normal course of life because they were living this incredible, epic adventure. And they got excited about it, and they saw God using them. And God's using you, by the way. I, there's some remarkable work that's taking place on this island. And it's not just in this church. God is pouring his spirit out. And we are a part of it. And I, and I think we're on the front edge of it. I don't think we're even anywhere close to its, its peak. And God's allowing us to participate. And I love the heart of this brand new church, not knowing any better, and jumping in and simply modeling themselves after Paul and after Christ and Silas and Timothy. And then by simply modeling and mimicking the spiritual DNA of these individuals, they were seeing something really significant. What was it? That they also became a model, and as they modeled, great things were happening in the lives of other people just like it had happened for them. This isn't rocket science. What Paul says is, the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses pass on to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others, 2 Timothy 2.2. That's all this is. It's the process of loving God, acting in obedience by making disciples, loving others, because one of the most loving things that a person can do for another person is help them grow in their Christian faith and become a tupas, a reliable model of Christ. And the result is is that they enter into this dynamic, incredible chain of events that's changing the world. And that's what Paul says next in verse 8. The Lord's message rang out from them in Macedonia, Macedonia and Achaia. This word uh, to ring out or that it rang out was exocheo. Uh, Echo is where we get our English word. So to echo out, it's reverberating. It's like an amplifier coming through this church. 
and it's reverberating out through Macedonia and Achaia, Macedonia being the northest part of Greece and Achaia being the most southern part of Greece. And what he's saying is from one end of the country to the other, people are hearing what's happening in your lives. Their faith in God had become well-known everywhere. And their reputation was well-known because of several things here in verse 9. Number one, the kind of reception they gave Paul. Secondly, how they turned from idols. They were not simply kind of slowly moving out of idolatry. They were renouncing idolatry. And for us, we don't usually bow down to uh, wooden idols or to stone or metal idols. But what we do struggle with is materialism and pride and arrogance and independence and all these things that are a part of our heart, things that, that actually occupy your heart and your passion and your finances more than Christ. Anything like that is an idol. It can even be a family member. It can be your children. It can be your husband or your spouse. It can be uh, a job. It can be a car. It can be a, 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 a hobby. But whatever these things are that were in the Thessalonians' life, they renounce them. They turn from them, from them. It doesn't mean that you can't enjoy the material things of this life, but they can't be your passion. Your passion is to be for Christ because it says they turn from idols and then they turned to God. And the last thing that Paul says is that they were waiting for his son from heaven. I, I, I'm not trying to bombard you with Greek words here, but they're so enlightening to our understanding of the text this word is anemeno. We know meno, remember what, uh, hupo mone, mone, that word means to remain. Ana means upward. And meno, when it's put together, uh, anemeno, it means to remain patiently looking forward or upward. That's what that word means. And so this Thessalonican church was looking forward to something. What was it? Well, we're told that it's Christ, and we're going to be studying that through this book, the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ in this glorious future that God has for those that believe in Jesus Christ. They were looking patiently, waiting in a state of expectancy uh, for a future event that they were convinced and confident would take place. You remember when the angel came to the disciples when Jesus was ascending in the cloud and he said, why are you looking up into heaven? The same Jesus, as he's going now, will return in the same manner. And Jesus is going to come back for the church, and the Thessalonican church was waiting for it to happen. They were waiting expectantly with an upward look. And that's why Colossians chapter 3 says that, you know, we are to set our minds and our hearts and fix our eyes on the coming of Jesus. Because he is coming. That's the message of the gospel. And that's the message that this church heard. And the result was, is that they were being patient. In fact, that's what it says in James 5 to all of us. You too then, be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. And what will he do when he comes for the church? He will rescue us from God's wrath. He's going to rescue us from the wrath of God. What wrath is he talking about? Well, you might be tempted to think it's the final wrath. That's part of it. But the Bible tells us in Romans 1.18 that God's wrath is already being poured out on the ungodly. So the unbelievers in our life, and if you're an unbeliever here today, what the Bible says is that God is already bringing wrath upon you. Not to destroy you, but to motivate you to respond to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The second thing where God demonstrates his wrath is during the great tribulation, God says he's going to pour out his wrath on mankind. The church will be gone already in the rapture of the church. But those that remain that have not received Christ as their Savior will suffer this terrible, terrible time that's unmatched, never will be uh, matched again in human history, and it's coming. We're in the birth pangs now, but those last days are at the door. But that's not all, because after that happens, then an unbeliever will face the great white throne judgment where they will have to give an account for every single sin and their penalty phase will include a penalty for every single sin that they've committed in their entire life. And then, that's not all, because at the end of that penalty phase, then the final wrath will be that God will eject and send that person into the eternal flames of hell. That is devastating. That's what God has saved us from. Listen what awaits 
the believer. We are rescued and blessed having received salvation in Christ. We have God's present blessing and forgiveness and adoption and new life in this life, broken as it is at times. We have God's future protection from the great tribulation via the rapture that we're going to study in chapter 4, verse uh, 17. We have God's future reward. You know, there is a, a judgment seat for the believer. Did you know that? The unbeliever faces this terrifying great white throne. The believer faces the Bema seat of Christ. The Bema seat is a place of reward for your faithful service to your king. You will never hear in, in the kingdom of God as a Christian when you are confronted by Christ and you stand face to face with him, not one sin will ever be brought to your attention because they've all been forgiven. You'll never have to make an accounting. You know this whole more bad theology? You're going to have to stand before God, you know, as a believer. And he's, gonna go, he's got a big, you know, HD television screen up there and he's going to show you every wrong thing you've done. And he's going to weigh it all out. Yes, you're saved, but boy, you're going you're to have to pay a price. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bema seat is a place where you will be rewarded like an Olympic champion for the part that you've played in the kingdom of God. As much as you've done, you'll be rewarded for. Everyone, I believe, most people at least, will be rewarded for something. But those that have served the Lord faithfully and, and understood this principle of the epic life and the principle that God is calling us to be impacting people's lives and passing on our spiritual DNA and that our life is about that, not about all the other things that we make it about. When a person does that, they are in for a rich reward because they are bringing back to God a good return for the investment that's been made in them. And then finally, it gets better because the believer gets to spend eternity ruling and reigning with Christ in a new and recreated heaven and earth. I Every time I think about that, just the words coming out of my mouth make me excited. Can't talk about it right now. But that's what awaits the believer. Paul sees all these things in the church, and he encourages them. And I want to tell you, as a pastor, I see these things in you. I think we see them in each other. And my only encouragement is let's keep excelling. Let's keep moving forward in the very things that the church was, was applauded for here. They responded to the gospel. Have you responded to the gospel? That's so important. There may be a few people here this morning that you have not responded and asked God to forgive you and received the forgiveness that Christ paid for and died for on the cross for the penalty phase that you will face at the great white throne if you don't let Christ pay for it you will face the penalty phase. But if you allow Christ to be your covering, if you allow Christ to pay your price, then 2,000 years ago, he took that penalty phase for you and has made it possible for you to be forgiven and restored and brought into a new relationship with God. If you haven't done that, I encourage you to get that taken care of. For the rest of us, we need to follow the example of the Thessalonians. They were faithfully following Paul's example, but in this case, you need to find someone that's a little farther ahead, that's inspiring, that you want to model your life after, and, and go ahead and do that. And then just be aware, that you, be aware that you need to be a model for others. That's part of this great tradition in the church of God and in the plan of God is that we would make disciples. And then finally... They turned from their idols, they were serving the living God, and they were looking upward and forward to the soon and coming king. What a great message. What a great passage of scripture. God has so much ahead for us. He knows that you're struggling. He knows the challenges you've got. We've got to do the hoopomone, let it turn to worship, and keep moving forward anyway. My other favorite word is prokope. It means to beat your breast in grief and keep moving forward. And that's what life is like. We beat our breast in grief and we keep moving forward under the power and inspiration of God because God has called us to do something awesome and great. And every one of us, every one of you, is an integral, vital, important part because you've been chosen by God before the creation and foundation of the world to bring glory and praise to your king and to have an impact and to bear fruit and to be rewarded when that day comes. I encourage you, be a part of it. Step into the stream and enjoy the ride. It's crazy. It's wild. It's epic and not boring. So if you're bored, you're missing the Christian life designed the way God meant it to be lived. Father, we thank you for this time this morning. And 
I just pray, Father, that you would take these simple words that you've given me, Father, and multiply them and use them, God, to advance your cause. Thank you for the Thessalonican church. Thank you for Paul's vision and his love and his uh, capacity to work with these young believers and be so encouraging and inspiring. Thank you for his willingness to put it all on the line and say, follow me as I follow Christ. Thank you for transitioning him from a very critical, prideful man into a man that found some of his greatest delight in helping others grow and discover the beauty of the knowledge and love of God. Lord, we want to be a part of this adventure. And so we're asking, move us, change us. And God, give us a heart to follow after Christ. Before we close, I just want to give those of you that may not uh, know Christ, that you've never really responded to the gospel, you've never really had a, a time of making pono with God where you've just owned up to your part, and you would like to do that this morning, and you simply need to tell God, I'm wrong, I've been wrong, and you've been right, and I haven't been listening to you, I haven't been responding, but I want to be forgiven of my sins. I want new life in Christ. And I believe that Jesus died on the cross for those sins. I believe that he paid my penalty phase and, and is waiting for me to make a, make a response. He's given me free will. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand right where you are, just briefly. I just want to see your hand. I want to pray for you before we end our service. Is there anyone that wants to receive Christ? You've never received him before, but you'd like to today. You're not even sure exactly what that means, but you want to be close with God, and you've never done that. Is there anyone here that wants to receive Christ? Okay, I don't see any hands. So I'm, an, I'm trusting that everyone here has made that decision. Lord, go with us today as we serve you and love you. Thank you for this passage. And Lord, I pray that we would become not only a follower of Christ, but a tupas, a, a, a replication of what you're like in character, in person, in our priorities, our values, and that our life might be seen as your life so that when people see us, they see a follower of Christ, a man or woman who's been impacted by the life-changing message of the gospel. Father, we pray for fruit, much fruit, lasting fruit to your glory and praise. Our desire is your name and renown. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.